a symbol respected the world over. For 60 years, a hallmark of British craftsmanship and painstaking attention to detail. And he's right. The Rolls-Royce was always built like no other car. Those two little words became a synonym for everything that was elegant, gracious, and aristocratic. And those plush leather seats have been polished by more titled bottoms than the lavatories at the House of Lords. In 1955, the Silver Cloud appeared. Looking like a cross between a stately home and the Flying Scotsman, this was the last of the aristocratic Royces. But when the 60s arrived, the cloud looked about as hip as Harold Macmillan. And so the Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow was born. For Rolls-Royce, this was their most significant car for 59 years. And it wasn't just because it was technically audacious, although it was. It was the first Rolls ever to have disc brakes. The first Rolls without a separate chassis. And it had hydraulic self-leveling suspension. Now, this car's claim to fame is that even Rolls-Royce couldn't predict how successful it would be. It sold 40,000 units over 15 years, a huge amount for the tiny crew factory. From 1965 to 1980, it was the best car in the world. And if you owned a Shad, you had some serious juice. <laughs> was the past. This was the first car to bring Rolls-Royce into, into the future, really. This was the first Rolls-Royce that got rid of the chauffeur. The back seat was no longer the place to be because you were missing the fun. Aimed squarely at the owner-driver, it felt distinctly nimble compared to the cloud. Launched at the Paris Motor Show, it cost £6,556, the price of three semis, ten minis, or two Daimler limousines. When the car was launched in October 1965, there was considerable excitement. Uh, after all, this was the first Rolls-Royce, new Rolls-Royce for ten years, and that's always a big event in motoring. The appearance of it was criticised by some as being a little bit ordinary, a little bit conventional, but the reputation rapidly grew, and general reaction was very favourable and helped get the car off to a very good start. Even General de Gaulle was forced to admit that yet again the English had built the best car in the world and built it beautifully. Building a Silver Shadow was a three-month-long process. It took the best of materials, as well as the best of engineering, and it took that almost priceless commodity time. You see, shadows didn't just shamble off the production line. They were genuinely hand-built using the finest of everything, right down to springy Wilton carpets and soft lambswool overrugs. The radiator shell that you see here has got this very sharp edge, which comes simply by hand mitering, silver soldering, done by one man who bends the plates over his... Um, leg in order to ensure that it looks straight even though it's actually curved. There's not a single flat surface there, not a single straight line. That's the way Mr. Rice has done it. When he's made it, he signs it on the back. Every radiator has the initials of the man who made it behind it. I went up to the factory and they showed me around, gave me a big tour of when I was a pop singer. And they, the chairman, they showed me all around and, you know, went into the hide. I always remember the hide where they're making the yeah. leather seats. My grandfather was what they call a leather courier. And he worked for Connolly's, who actually make the hides for, for this. Uh, he used to make a great big fuss of this uh, hide being needed for the Rolls-Royce car. And when I saw his work in a Rolls-Royce car, I was, oh, I was thrilled, you know. And then when I got one, I never stopped feeling the leather. Uh, it was a lovely feeling. I, mean, I love my granddad. He was, a, he was a real gentleman, a lovely man. The veneer. When you, when you see it in the factory, and the way they match them up, oh, I mean, the skill. And it's skill that we, in a way, is lost now, because we don't need it so much now, because technology can do it for us. But there's nothing like, if you want to get handmade skill, this is the car. For the first year or so, the car was bought by established Rolls-Royce customers, who would go to Rolls-Royce showrooms with their silver clouds, and part exchange them for shiny new silver shadows. But then a year or so later, something very strange happened. Second-hand shadows started appearing in the Times newspaper for more than they cost new. This was the first car in the world to attract a premium second-hand over its new list price. And that was because there was an insatiable demand tearing away at a limited supply. Everybody wanted shads.
Fred should have had a role at the same time I built mine. We thought it was very similar, lovely clip. Jimmy, can't that we've had one. John Mills, or now Sir John Mills, lovely Johnny Mills. And Max, I bet he would have had one. <laughs> uh, I remember <coughs> Peter Noon buying one in the singer Herman's um, Hermits. Kenny Lynch, lovely character, Kenny. <laughs> I remember getting out of out of a Rolls Royce in Berkeley Square and having jeans and a t-shirt on in the 60s and somebody said, oh, my God, isn't it nothing sacred? My manager said, you know, you've got to drive something uh, and be a recognized person and one thing or another and uh, try to be a, a star person, you know. And the car that I chose, of course, was this one. It, uh, I think it's the first thing you do when you get a big royalty check is go out and buy yourself a Rolls Royce. They were more in keeping with um, everyday celebrities, may I say. We passed the Rolls Royce shop. We saw two gold Rolls Royces. And we said, shall we treat ourselves and buy two <laughs> gold Rolls Royces? Let's show off. It's been Jewish, so you just put a bagel Royce. A bagel Royce. Well, we don't have Rolls, we have bagels. Right. I think yours, we mind the light. You no, mine was a really real gold and yours a dark gold. Yeah, Tommy's with a tacky one. Say you're appearing in Coventry. And you thought your, your publicity wasn't good and people didn't know that you were at the theatre. You drive around that town a few times or drive around the city and, and people would turn around and say, you know, they'd know you were there. We mainly got them because it was like putting a stamp on with success. We, we, we made got it. success. Yeah. I think the first working class pop singer or kid that bought one of these broke the class system. It was like intravenous, straight into the classes and say, well, you don't exist anymore. We've arrived. So what does it feel like? Forget all the oversteer and understeer and driving dynamics. What does a silver shadow make you feel? You don't drive these cars. You float on them. They float along like something on water. It's about insulating you from the wild and whirling world outside. You really don't feel much. It's very, very quiet. The, the superstructure doesn't shudder. You're protected, cocooned, cosseted. You look out imperially on everything around you. You're higher than other cars. You have not a front, but a prow in front of you with this wonderful chromium sculpture. She sits there, winging her way, cleaving through the air. The minute this car starts, you smile inwardly because you're having a wonderful time. And the only word I can find to describe the sensation is agreeable. Very, very, very agreeable. For Rolls-Royce, the Shadow was their most popular car ever, spawning a small family of derivatives. The Bentley T version, identical except for different grille and badging, was £60 cheaper than the double R. Aimed at the more discreet end of the market, Bentleys were never heavily promoted and racked up only 3,000 sales. I always felt, you know, unless you're chauffeur-driven, the Rolls is, is, is terribly pompous. It's saying, look at me, I'm driving a Rolls. And I don't want people to look at me for that reason. I don't want to look at me at all. If you look like me, you don't want to look at you. But uh, it, it's a gentleman's car, the Bentley. It was always the car for the gentleman, and the Rolls was the car for the nouveau riche. And thus it still is. You only have to look at the people driving them, you know. There was a shadow two-door saloon, later to be renamed and rebadged as the Corniche, also available as a convertible. Styled by coach builder Mulliner Park Ward, it was a Rolls for those of a more outgoing disposition. I love the line of this car. This is probably one of the best I've seen. Yeah. Yes, this is my, my style. My style of car. I happen to know that you have the first Corniche ever made, which you bought years and years and years ago, and you still have it. Yeah, <clears throat> I still do have that car. And it's now retired to the south of France. It resides in the sun. That particular model is never dated. 